This book right here is an old textbook from 1855. It's a great book. It's written by a black historian, a first black appointed federal office. It's called The Colored Patriots of the American Revolution. Now, we studied that as a textbook. That is not a skinny little book that, that we have there. I mean, there's a lot of patriots in the American Revolution that we studied. I read Black the, patriots. I read the book um, Giants and was uh, just amazed, just amazed at this man, Frederick yeah. Douglass. Incredible guy. We don't really even know. Most people can say, I think the audience would say, yeah, I can reckon. I know that's Frederick Douglass, but you're uh, not really sure. He looks kind of just like a black Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you're, you're like, I don't really know his story, I think. Am I right saying that or not? You kind of know him, but you're not sure why. Right, Tell we his have, story. We've got a movie about Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. Movies about Martin Luther King Jr. And for some reason in American history, we think that the only time blacks stood up for their rights was when Martin Luther King decided to leave the pulpit and hit... Uh, right. The stump, uh, the uh, hit the stump to make speeches. Uh, the bottom line is, for the longest time, we've adopted this victim narrative about blacks in the United States. That the only role they played was a victim to white majority oppression. When I teach my course on Black American politics, I always stress to my students that when we talk about King and the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, we need to call it the modern civil rights movement because blacks yeah. from before the yeah. revolution yeah. were pressing, prudently pressing for their rights. American history could be described as one long civil rights struggle. Our first Emancipation Proclamation, Declaration of Independence. That's right. right. That's right. It was, but it was, it was, it, it's been this way. It's going on now. It's going on. It's, it's, it's people trying to grab others' rights. And, and that never changes. That's, that's human, human history. Nature. That's yeah. human history. Yeah. If I ask the audience, um, when did America have its first African American judge? What year would you say? Anybody? Take a guess. Judge. 1860s? Anybody? 1770. 1770. 1770. Amy, is that just a wild guess? It, no, not. I wasn't sure exactly, but I think it's about. 1770. Tell me. 1768. Wentworth Cheswell, New Hampshire, elected to office in New Hampshire. He was reelected for the next 49 years, held eight different political positions. Really cool story uh, about him is we all know that Paul Revere made his midnight ride. We also know he wasn't the only guy riding that night. Mm -hmm. Another guy riding went with Chesel, black and white riding. Now, how is night. it possible? Did you know that we had an African American ride to say the British are coming, the British are coming? Yes. <laughs> Amy did. did. Amy did. Anybody else besides Amy know that? Two, three. Okay, three people in the audience. Yeah. He, that is, he, was, he was such a great guy, and we never hear about him because he rode north, and Paul Revere rode west. And Revere was going after Reverend Jonas Clark's church because that's where Hancock and Adams were, which was him. And that's where we had blacks and whites, as you pointed out, laying on the ground after that battle. Wentworth Cheswell rode north telling people the British are coming. And it was from the north that all those people came to Boston to take on the British at Bunker Hill and everywhere else. So we don't hear about his ride because the British went west, and that's where all the action happened. But it was a couple of days later when all these people started coming down from New Hampshire and Vermont and elsewhere, and that's where he had ridden, telling them what was up. Lucas, when we, when we come back, I want to take a quick break. When we come back, I want you to tell me a little bit about, um, a, a little bit of, uh, about Frederick Douglass. Sure. Um, uh, I, I, you know, the, the, the opening of Giants is, is so captivating, where you see a man who has struggled, um, uh, who was kept, I mean, it sounds horrible to say, but kept in, I guess, nice slavery, if there's such a thing. Uh, how would you describe how he... Well, he, he didn't grow up as, as a slave in the deep south, the deep cotton states. So, right. I mean, this, the phrase, being sold down the river, that has an actual historical connection. To be wow. sold down the river was the worst thing because you went from something pretty bad to awfully bad. <laughs> right, okay. So, a slave in Maryland is not as bad as being a slave down in the Delta. And what happened to his family where he was originally held? Because they sold him. They sold him. He never knew his siblings. Um, met his mother, or knew, had vague memories of his mother maybe a few times. He remembers her calling him my little Valentine, and that's why he dates his birthday 
February 14th, but he doesn't have a birth certificate. He doesn't know when he was born. Okay. We think February 18, uh, 1818. Okay, so he was in, um, you know, uh, a slavery that was um, northern slavery, but then uh, he was sold into horrible, horrible conditions, and he witnessed for the first time somebody's whipping him, and he's like, whoa, 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 what is this all about? And, um, and it wasn't too much longer that he's sitting and having a conversation with Abraham Lincoln because right. he was so impressive. We'll tell you that story coming up in just a second. founders and the role that African Americans played in the founding of this country in the next 15 minutes than you probably have learned your entire life. Back with me is David Barton, founder of the president of and founder, founder and president of Wall Builders, and Lucas Morrell. He is a professor at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. I want to go back to Frederick Douglass here because Frederick Douglass actually was very upset at our founders yeah. because he said, I'm, I'm, I'm not just three-fifths of yeah. a human being. I'm a full human being. Mm -hmm. This is an argument that is used even today, that Frederick Douglass corrected. Yes. Tell me the story. What happened was after he escaped in 1838, he went, he, he ended up in New York. In New York, he gets discipled by a lot of anti slavery folks, and, and that's the Lysander Spooners and Garrett Smith and William Lloyd Garrison, et cetera. And Massachusetts uh, society hears him do his testimony, and they said, Oh man, you got to speak for us. Well, in the meantime, they're saying, You know, you need to overthrow the Constitution because the Constitution is a slavery document. The founders gave us slavery in the document, and there's all these clauses of slavery. And he believed that. But bless his heart, when the Massachusetts Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society said, we want to pay you to go on the road full time. He said, okay, uh, I got to make sure I know this stuff. So he sat down and read the Constitution for himself, not just what the guys had taught him. He read it himself, and he read the documents surrounding it, the debates going around it. And he comes out with this epiphany and says, this is a great anti-slavery document. And, and he says, every clause in it. And you go, whoa, time out. How can the three-fifths clause be an anti-slavery clause? Real easy. He read the convention notes. What happened was you had all these anti-slavery founding fathers. You had, uh, you had, for example, James Wilson. You had uh, Elbridge Elb Sherry. You had Luther Martin. Ben um, Franklin. All these guys. All these anti-slavery guys. And you had three hardcore southern states that were pro-slavery. There's Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. And so the Constitution says every 30,000 inhabitants you have, you get a representative to the House of Representatives. And, and in South Carolina, in Georgia, there's more blacks than there are whites, and they're slaves. And they said, great, every 30,000 slaves we've got, we'll get another member of Congress. Guys up north said, no, 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 we're not doing that. If you want to count them, you free them. Every free person you have, you can, you can get 30,000, you can have. And, and they said, no, no, we're going to count this, or we're not going to be part of these United States. So this debate goes back and forth. And what's really funny is the guys in the South said, you know, blacks are property. I love yeah, they're what... Not, they're not people. They're, they're not, they're not people. people, but they want to count they them want to as count people. Them. And, and see, the guys in the North said, no, every Every black is equal to a white. We're all created equal. You get, you get 30,000 free blacks, you get a member of Congress. And that was the incentive to free blacks. It was, you get to count them mm -hmm. from Congress. So the guys up north started having fun with the guys down south. They said, you know, you guys say that blacks are, are property. And Elbridge Jerry did this, and Luther Martin did it out, out of Maryland. They said, okay, here's what we're going to do up north. is You're counting 30,000 pieces of property to get a, a member of Congress. We're going to count 30,000 chairs and horses and cows. We'll count our property. Every 30,000 <laughs> pieces of property we get, we get an anti anti-slavery member to Congress. So they went back and forth on this thing, and, and what they finally ended up was the three-fifths clause that says, okay, we will count three-fifths of the slave population, not individuals, which meant you now had to have 50,000 before you could get a pro-slavery rep to Congress. The three-fifths clause cut the slavery representation in Congress in half. And when Frederick Douglass read that, he said, the three-fifths clause, that has nothing to do with worth. That has to do with representation. It makes it harder to get a pro-slavery representative in Congress the Constitution's an anti-slavery document. It was. And it was. It was. And That's it was why Frederick they changed. Douglass who points that out. It, the original document for the Declaration of Independence was life, liberty, and property. And property. Property. That's right. The reason being, they changed it. They changed it to pursuit of happiness because they didn't want the South to say, ah, That's ha, right. ha, South. you've got chairs, we've got people. <laughs> um, by the way, all of these people here, most people, in these, these pictures, most people cannot identify them, um, but they all played a role in the founding of our nation or the refounding of our nation. Um, and um, these people 
are now in the textbooks because of Texas, yeah. because of what happened. These people, they fought to put these people in. Why would the left fight to put these people in? L let me go back to the picture we had earlier of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Okay. Because if you take that picture of the Battle of Bunker Hill, and, and this is a painting that was done in 1817, and the guy who did this, John Trumbull, did this painting. John Trumbull was at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He's okay. the guy who drew the, the maps for Washington of what went on. Okay. Over here on the right, we have Peter Salem. Now, he, he had 14 military commendations that day. He is the hero. They brought him in front of George Washington to get special honors from the commander in chief. He's the guy standing behind the white guy with the sword. That's right. Now, the white guy with the sword is Thomas Grosner. So you have Thomas Grosner and you have Peter Salem, black and white fighting side by side. But Peter is definitely the hero that day. 1817, this painting is done, and all the way up until the 1980s, we knew that that was Peter Salem, the hero of Bunker Hill. 1980s, the professors got together and said, oh, no, that's not Peter Salem. Um, we think that that's Grosvenor's slave.